afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Barry Moore and I'm the current Vice President of Friends of Edgewood. Um, unfortunately, Peter Ingram, our president, had a family emergency and will not be able to join us today. So I will be the MC. And I would like to thank everybody for setting aside this time to Zoom with us on our 27th annual general meeting. And please bear with me as we go through this since I'm an 11th hour pinch hitter. <laughs> um, obviously, we all missed the annual picnic and meeting in the preserve, which is our long tradition, but COVID-19 pandemic has preempted life as normal. Hence, we at the Friends of Edgewood have given this year's meeting the theme, Rise to the Challenge. Um, we will hear today about amazing volunteers who have indeed risen to the challenge, many unanticipated challenges driven by the pandemic, the weather, the fires, and all the humans who have flocked to Edgewood seeking a peaceful respite in this difficult year. This is the first time we've ever attempted a virtual meeting and we've tried hard to make sure everyone has a good Zoom experience today, but if you're having any technical trouble um, at any time in the meeting, you can use the chat feature and um, you'll see that at the bottom of your screen. You can communicate privately with Perry McCartney, Bacardi, who will um, be our designated tech support. And if you have a question or a general comment that you'd like to share with the group during the presentations, send it to Perry um, via chat and we'll check with him from time to time to try and address those questions and comments. And if we can't get to everything, then we will try to follow up with you after the meeting. So just click the chat button, type in your question and send it to chat manager, Perry McCarty, and we should be good. Um, at the end, we'll have a short time where everybody will be unmuted so that we can say goodbye and any follow-up comments or questions. So I think that's enough housekeeping. At this time, I'd like to introduce the 2020 Board of Directors. And as I read their names, Maybe they can each wave at their cameras. Um, hopefully you'll be able to spot them in our large crowd today. Lori Alexander, Sandy Bernhard, Laura Fox, Kathy Goforth, Peter, who's not with us, Bill Korbolts, Kathy Korbolts, Linda Leong, our secretary, Angela Mallet, our treasurer, Perry McCarty, Todd Remke, and myself, Barry Moore. In 2020, we became a pretty dang good virtual organization, adapting quickly and sometimes comically to Zoom and the other tools that we needed to help the organization maintain its administrative governance and advocacy responsibilities and activities. And many on the board contributed to the hard work of converting our in-person collaboration time to this new normal of remote conversations and I'd like to really thank them all, and especially Todd Remke, whose board term will be ending in December. Also in virtual attendance are two very favorite scientists, Stuart Weiss and Crystal Niederer, and their firm Creekside Science, most of you know, provides a range of consulting services that underpin Project 467, and we will be hearing from Stu in a few minutes. So before I begin, I'll pause and see if we have any Questions before we get started? No, we don't. Okay, great. Let me see if I can share my screen with y'all and Okay, so hopefully can you all see my screen? Wait, nod your heads up and down if you can. <laughs> okay, great. Rise to the challenge. That's pretty much been the board's mode since the pandemic began and several Edgewood programs had to be suspended in the face of the shelter in place directive. The education center closed, wildflower hikes were canceled, junior explorer walks were suspended, the remaining docent training classes were canceled. It was pretty hard, but our program coordinators and their teams showed thoughtful leadership and made proactive decisions in the best interests of visitor and volunteer safety. In light of the initial directives on March 16th from the county, the state, and the CDC, the board and our program coordinators began to set a longer planning trajectory across all our programs and projects. 
we all knew this was uncharted territory and there were going to be changes at any time but there was a real urgency to rise to the challenge and there were many hours spent researching and talking through what the best approach to programs volunteer engagement and safety should be then on march 21st we watched as hundreds of visitors descended on edgewood that first weekend and the park was packed there were trails were full the hikers were too close to each other red flags went up we reached out to county park staff with our observations our concerns and suggestions we also tried to get the word out about safety concerns via email and through our social media universe then on march 26th a few days later we saw the advent of one-way trails at edgewood then suddenly on march 28th all the county parks were closed we despite all the best efforts the sheer volume of the park visitors overwhelmed the system and threatened to enable the spread of the virus after six full weeks of closures on may 4th the parks department activated their multi-phase covid reopening plan for the county edgewood was initially put in phase one status with the one-way trails then phase two was started on june 10th with additional facilities open or partially accessible and phase two is what continues to this day just when we were getting used to this new normal from august 13th to september 12th COVID was trumped by record heat waves and disastrous wildfires. All the county parks were closed again from August 21st to September 3rd, while park rangers helped battle the blazes and protect Pescadero Creek, Memorial, and Sam McDonald parks, which were the ones that were most threatened by the fires. These past weeks have shown that the dangers of 2020 are not yet in remission, and the restoration of full programming is up in the air and the impacts to flora and fauna are unknown. So this has been the setting for our beloved 467 acres over the past 29 weeks. And you might be asking yourselves, so how does an all volunteer friends group rise to such an overwhelming challenge? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. In 2019, Friends of Edgewood reported a record breaking average of 1100 volunteer effort hours per month in the first eight months of 2020 we are averaging 1100 volunteer effort hours per month so this means that with all the covid dangers restrictions all the days of closure the heat the smoke the fire our volunteers still found ways to invest a high number of hours in the preserve while adapting to this ever-changing situation and staying safe um, I'll pause here just to see if there are any questions. No, uh, okay. no, there are no questions now. All right. So this does not mean we did the same things in 2020 that we did in 2019. Far from it. There were no wildflower hikes, no education center, no junior explorer program. Adjustments for our weed warriors had to be made. An extended hiatus for the road warriors had to happen. And there are many other foreshortened or canceled activities because we were constantly looking for opportunities to re-engage volunteers in edgewood we needed to be especially nimble in pursuing our mission to preserve educate and restore in 2020 we had to pivot towards new threats to edgewood's habitat resources some that just happened to land during covid and others that were a consequence of the pandemic shutdown most of you know the weed warriors play an essential role in controlling invasive weeds in the preserve. When the parks shut down in March, we were able to get permission for the weed warriors to continue their work, albeit with smaller socially distanced teams. They gamely upped their number of work days from two to three per week to make up for having fewer weeders at a time. And because of their flexibility and determination, we did not let 2020 become the year of the weed at Edgewood. We also worked closely with Hannah Ormshaw, the park's natural resource manager and her team on a number of projects to ensure that the efforts by pg e and Cal Fire, which included some mechanized intrusions into Edgewood, 
were conducted with the proper best practices and within all of the applicable environmental regulations. The top issues over these past months have been um, a new PG&E power line vegetation removal project, CAL FIRE and Parks Department fuel reduction program, and new CAL FIRE emergency turnarounds. After the wrenching experience of 2019 with the PG&E gas clearance, we were hoping that we would have a little bit of a break. <laughs> but that was not to be. There was a new round of vegetation removal announced and we mobilized once again to make sure that the work was done with absolute minimum requirement for power line safety and that the minimal environmental impacts were also followed. In a no good plan goes unpunished incident, we had a contractor truck who went rogue and damaged a section of the sensitive grassland near the butterfly habitat and to her credit, Hannah filed a complaint with the state and is hopeful that pg e will be held fully accountable for the damage. Even before the most recent wildfires, CAL FIRE and the Parks Department have been working on fuel reduction program at Edgewood. This joint agency effort finally was completed in the last few months and some final reseeding and restoration will be done in the winter. Many of us have witnessed emergency response vehicles on Edgewood service roads, and there have been several occasions over the years where the heavy trucks have driven off road and caused significant damage in the process. The park staff is responding to new pressure from Cal Fire and the Woodside Fire District to create permanent gravel turnouts throughout the preserve. We're working closely with staff to assess needs, determine feasibility, and locate a reasonable number of turnouts to satisfy the fire agencies and more importantly, head off future off-road damage when emergency responses are in motion. Park staff believes that they are clearly identified and well-maintained. There'll be less damage to sensitive habitat in the long run. Any questions now? Uh, no, no, no questions. Okay. Another one of our um, habitat restoration challenges has been the proliferation of new undesirable social trails. And this is becoming a big problem. Social trails heighten the trail maintenance issues and they threaten the preserve's habitats. They detract from Edgewood's beauty and they legitimize improper visitor behavior. Our newly established goal is to significantly reduce or eliminate traffic on existing social trails and prevent the creation of new trails and restore the habitat damage. There are three general categories of actions that we're planning. We're going to be erecting some barriers, placing signs, and restoring the trails to their natural state. We need support from parks for erecting the barriers and the signs, but we've been given permission from Hannah to proceed with restoration. And this photo is of some Boy Scout volunteers from Troop 47 in Foster City who helped restore and reseed one of the most visible and persistent social trails, which you will all recognize. So we're really grateful for their help and you can expect a lot more to go on this year with, um, with our social trail elimination effort. <laughs> Being the can-do attitude, a can-do organization that we are, we also initiated some new activities and made updates to some old ones. There is our showcase site adoption program. And as so often occurs in Edgewood, when FOE members bring their passion to a problem that's central to our mission, great things happen. For several years, Bill and Kathy Korboltz have skillfully and steadfastly nurtured a patch of chaparral just inside the Sunset Gate, affectionately known as Corby Corners. This past summer, as the fuel reduction work and the PG&E vegetation removal effort were winding down, Bill and Kathy became very concerned that all that raw, disturbed soil in those work areas would foster an outbreak of new weeds and contaminate their adopted site next door. So they simply put their backs into a greatly expanded adoption site and accomplished a thorough hand weeding treatment of the area over multiple weeks. This picture shows the brush clearing done by PG&E after Bill and Kathy removed all the weeds that had invaded the site. <laughs> Most people would complain about the long hours in the sun and vow never again not teen corbels. They're even more enthusiastic about adoption sites and are actively recruiting volunteers to expand this fledgling and important program. 
So keep an eye out for future announcements of opportunities to help next spring. This summer, we also initiated Edgewood's first citizen science monarch butterfly survey with a new emphasis on milkweed in the preserve. It was a delightful collaboration with a large network of organizations dedicated to restoring the monarch and partnering with landowners to increase the butterfly's food supply. And Stu will be telling us more about this effort in a few minutes. We had a changing of the guard for the Friends of Edgewood's Blooming Hikes and the weekly Edgewood Wildflower Survey this year. We are tremendously grateful for the many years that Mary and Dennis Wilson dedicated to conducting the Blooming Hikes twice a week from 2012 to early 2020. These surveys of blooming plants were actually first started by Diane Hunt in 1998. So this year we have a new team stepping up, Sandy Bernhardt, Deanna Scheel, Gina Barton, and Carolyn Bowker, and with backup help from Catherine Stracota. While they now only hike once a week, they have added a bird survey thanks to Gina's ornithology expertise, photos and links to iNaturalist, along with Sandy's email that captures the essential magical things going on with plants, insects, or animals each week. If you're not subscribed to this email list, you're going to want to make sure you sign up right after the meeting. It's really great. Um, you can sign up on the Edgewood Wildflower Survey page on the website, or if you have trouble finding that, just email info at friendsofedgewood.org and we'll help you get set up. Any questions? See, there are no questions right now, but I, I did just put on, the, on your chat screen, I put uh, the link to the Wildflower Survey site if anyone wants to go to that. Great, thank you. So we were also able to gain momentum with a few other projects and grant funded commitments. As part of the Green Grass Project, the newly created Edgewood Farms seed amplification facility has far exceeded, exceeded all hopes and expectations for the first crop of native seed producers. So a major thank you to Perry, who took the initial seed collection initiative in 2019 and leveraged park staff interest in setting up the farm and the picnic area. Um, Perry has a fine green thumb and for a few nervous days early in the shutdown, he was gaining fame in the deer community as the best salad chef ever. Um, fortunately, we got some quick fence work done and shut down the salad bar and the first bumper crop of seeds was saved. So we're looking forward to this being a really important part of our green grass initiative in the future. The, the, the native garden at the Bill and Jean Lane Education Center is often the first thing that visitors see when they pass through the main entrance to Edgewood. And over the years, the garden has been created entirely by volunteers using sustainable practices along with much love and skilled tending. It's become an inspiring and rich organic environment for showcasing the native plants that grow at Edgewood. This year, thanks to a 4Rs grant from San Mateo County's Office of Sustainability, we've added some new paths and interpretive signs in the garden and educational materials to the Education Center. Once it opens, it will be able to take advantage of those. <laughs> Our longtime native garden steward, Howie Smith, along with fellow board member Lori Alexander and I worked together to secure the grant and lead an implementation effort with the help of the rest of our team. And it really came out great. I hope you'll um, go check out all the new signs and the paths the next time that you are there. So one last check for questions before we move on to Stuart's presentation. Uh, no questions. Okay, great. Well, then now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stuart Weiss from Creekside Science. Stu and his team at Creekside have been an integral part of habitat restoration at Edgewood for decades now. Stu has been in love with Edgewood since he first set foot on it with a butterfly net in search of the bay checker spots in 1980. And since then, he helped stop the golf course, witnessed the extinction of the butterfly, uncovered the fertilizing impact of Highway 280's nitrogen emissions, and with his colleagues at Creekside has worked to restore the biodiversity of our beloved 467 acres. He's gonna be sharing some of his most rec recent work being done this year. 
And so now I will turn things over to Stu. Okay, so now I need to get my PowerPoint up. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to give you a um, kind of a whirlwind tour of some uh, some of Project Four Six Seven, um, how to enhance native plant diversity and what I call the coefficient of beauty at Edgewood Natural Preserve. First, a real quick update on the Bay Checker Spot Butterfly. Our uh, Stu, real, your yeah? presentation is not showing. Oh, it should be on screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. That's what when I hit share screen. So I think Bill needs to let me share screen. Don't watch the man behind the curtain. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. It's Okay, let me go back. Working to now. Yeah, good. okay, good. We can get back to full screen mode here. Okay, so a real brief update on the Bay Checker Spot Butterfly, um, our icon of Edgewood. Uh, over the years, we've learned how to restore the habitat and undo the uh, at least temporarily the damage done by the invasive grasses from the nitrogen fertilization from 280. Here's an example of how mowing has increased the cover of native forbs and reduced the cover of Italian ryegrass. And uh, the, we've had no translocation since 2017. We decided to just leave, let the population do its thing without swamping it with new material and the population is barely hanging on, um, but it's still there. We'll be talking more about that uh, over the coming months. On a much more positive note with the San Mateo thorn mint, uh, we have pretty much saved this species from extinction through the collective efforts of Edgewood, uh, Friends of Edgewood Creekside and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. In 2009, there were 249 plants in one site uh, occupying a few dozen square meters. Um, as of 2020, after 10 years of seeding and uh, spreading the thornman seeds, we uh, now have about 43,000 plants in six sites five at Edgewood and one on Pulgus Ridge. And within the original occupied habitat, there were less than 50 ornaments. So in the photograph on the right, you can see more plants within that photograph than existed in the world in uh, 2009. So again, this is saving a species uh, from extinction. But we're gonna move away from the uh, showy serpentine grasslands into the more fertile grasslands. So in the foreground, we have our serpentine grasslands and uh, looking beyond in the background are those uh, often referred to as non-serpentine grasslands, but we're gonna call them fertile grasslands because it's better to define it by what it is than what it isn't. The fertile grasslands have been the realm of the weed warriors over about 30 years now. Um, and it's utterly impressive that the macro weeds are on the run. Things like star thistle, Italian thistle, all the big obvious things that can be pulled because of tens of thousands of volunteer hours over decades. Um, it's it's an incomparable effort, and there's no effort in California that I know of that has been more successful than the Edgewood Week Warriors. So kudos to all of you. But, you know, it's one thing to remove weeds, um, and, but there are 
you get the food. We want to look at these grasslands and really try to enhance the biodiversity in this fertile grassland. So the goals of the Green Grass Project are to reduce non-native annual grass and fork cover, so kind of get rid of the weeds. We want to increase native cover. And after a lot of consideration um, and experience, the way to increase the native cover is to occupy the space with native perennials because they can stand up to the re inevitable reinvasion by the non-native grasses and forbs. We need to develop site-specific recipes. It's not one size fits all across Edgewood because of the varied environments. And we want to propagate key species by seed and uh, not making plugs. And we're going to be thinking long term in decades, just like it's taken decades to get the weeds down. Um, we want to look at this as a decades long process um, so we don't have to do it all at once. And we can start with some uh, you know, experiments and baby steps. This project um, is funded by Friends of Edgewood and uh, we got a grant from the California Department of Food and Agriculture that uh, with a revi renewed weed management area program. Um, and I really need to call out uh, Peter for administering this grant. Um, it's a non-trivial process administering state grants. So we have to start addressing what have been called micro weeds. So the great example of a micro weed is the Brachypodium distachyon or purple false brome. It's an annual grass. Uh, you can see it very widespread in the preserve in May where you get this pale green like we have here on the left. And then uh, after it sets seed and senesces, it builds up this very dense thatch that pretty much smothers the grassland. And there are other annual grasses and forbs that actually uh, consist the vast majority of the cover in these more fertile grasslands, very typical of uh, California grasslands at present. So in order to start uh, you know, controlling these grasses, um, we found that mowing worked really well in the serpentine grassland. And so we decided to start trying it um, in the more fertile grasslands with the right timing to nail particular species. And it does work well in serpentine grassland. And we've been doing the rotational mowing for the bait checker spot. In the fertile grasslands, we found, for example, if we target Avena, that's the wild oats, we increase the Brachypodium, the purple false prone. We then go, okay, now we're gonna go after the Brachypodium. We target the Brachypodium and we increase the non-native forbs, uh, the Erodium, uh, Cat's Ears, Hypocorus, and a, a series of other non-native weedy plants. And we find ourselves the weed of the month club. We're just on this cycle of moving from one non-native weed to another non-native weed. So we need to have some other technique to address this. So we've had some experiments at Edgewood and elsewhere using this technique called hydromechanical pulverization, it used to be called obliteration is basically pressure washing the grassland uh, just after we get the flush of germination of all the annuals following the first rains. And the results we got at Edgewood were actually pretty spectacular. So this is a site that was hit with the HMP and seeded in in 2012 and the results in 2018 are actually pretty spectacular for California grassland restoration. You can see the, the white yarrow is very abundant. We ended up with 30% native cover. There are five native perennial forb species that had substantial cover in this area. 
10% cover of the yarrow, which was one of the species seeded in. We have eight nat native annual forb species and 17% native annual forb cover, which is quite spectacular. So this is a technique that has some long-term uh, positive impact. So we want to expand it and experiment more with it. So uh, in general, uh, the HMP results are, you know, we eliminate the post-germination annuals early in the growing season. The existing native perennials expand and respond to the lack of competition and it could be quite spectacular. You, you start finding out <clears throat> how much competition those annuals are uh, exerting on the native perennials. At the horse park at Woodside, we could see the results from hundreds of yards away in these nice square uh, plots. For example, we'd have the flush of the buttercups, the ranunculus and yellow, followed by blue-eyed grass, followed by purple needle grass, and it really stood out from the surrounding grasslands. And importantly, it creates a very good seed bed for the natives that we're trying to seed in because we've gotten rid of all of those uh, non-native annuals and the thatch. We also are going to be experimenting with, I'm calling it for now, close trim mowing uh, using street string cutters with a, a special head. Get into the dirt a little bit. We hit the newly germinating annuals. We're hoping we'll get a similar effect as the HMP, but that remains to be seen. And without the water and specialized equipment, then this might end up being faster and less expensive. So as under the CDFA grant, uh, we've picked 10 areas to start doing experiments. Uh, we, these are chosen, so they're next to the roads, so we have access to them. And they represent a variety of different uh, pre-existing vegetation and environmental uh, conditions. So within each of these areas, we're going to have a plot that's just the HMP, then the HMP plus seeding. Then we're going to do the close trim mowing, close trim mowing plus seeding, have a control. And then within the treatment areas, uh, we're going to use small plots with our what we're calling boutique seeds raised at Edgewood Farm. So to get into the seeding, um, you know, here's the different options that we've, and pathways we've uh, scoped out and are using. So we all start with the field collection up there in the upper left. Those seeds can go into Edgewood Farms. If we get enough of those seeds and have the money, we can send them to Hedgerow Farms who will grow things out for us. Uh, not cheap, or they can go into the native garden. We can use the native garden as a seed source. Then these go back into the seat, into the field um, in treated plots. And what we're really hoping is that we establish the species within these treated plots and they self reproduce uh, the green arrows just going back so that um, you know, they expand their abundance, but then, you know, we'll do some more field collection. And if the density of the plants in the field support it, then we can directly put those into other field season, seeding or put them through Edgewood Farm or go to Hedgerow or put them in the native garden. Each species is going to have its own particular best um, pathway here. And I really want to give a call out to Perry for um, doing such a good job on the Edgewood Farms with uh, people's support. So we have some seeds to fool around with this year. 212 volunteer hours in 2019 collecting seeds. Uh, we have about 20 different species and thousands or tens of thousands of seeds of those species to start experimenting with. 
So the other component of the Green Grass Project were these rapid assessment plots or RAPs and it's the RAP team. And we basically want to know what's out there and where. So uh, we did 80 plus rapid assessment plots. And you can see the action there with Perry stroking his chin, thinking about something and Alf uh, writing down the percent cover of all the different species that we uh, came up with in that five meter radius circle. We did that about 80 times and we could look at different environments. We could also um, just, if we found an interesting spot that we wanted to document, we could just lay one in there. And uh, when we meet, it's like, oh, we're to, it's our voyage of discovery. So we were able to, uh, you know, just find all these really interesting things going on out at Edgewood in a very systematic way. So what did we find? We got 146 species in our plots. There were 18 native perennial grasses, rushes, and sedges, 37 native perennial forbs, 43 native annual forbs, some of which were sort of spilling over from the serpentine grassland, 15 non-native annual grasses, uh, 33 non-native annual forbs, and there's a lot of biodiversity out there that's present in our fertile grasslands. So documenting this um, was really a key step to understanding what do we have and what raw material we have in place to work with. So here's a gallery of some of our favorites. Uh, we have two species of mariposa lily. We have the uh, farewell to spring, the Clarkia rubicunda one of everybody's favorite in uh, May and June. Little annuals like the Plectritus, uh, really interesting native grasses in the middle there with uh, California millet grass. We have mule's ears. We found a lot of small stands of mule's ears that um, we're hoping we'll be able to expand those patches. Uh, in the pinks at the bottom, we have the Zeltnara, uh, or used to be Centaurium, and we have two species of checker bloom. Blue-eyed grass is pretty ubiquitous at at least low densities and can be quite dense in some areas. Found a few patches of nice uh, desert parsley, the Lomatium. Uh, some fantastic stands of annual lupins, lupinus bicolor, and then behind the lupin, you can see the little uh, lotus or acnes fawn. And then uh, with a buttercup that is being visited by a native moth, which reminds us that these plants support uh, a web of life above and beyond the plants themselves. We have some truly fantastic stands of uh, purple needle grass, which is the California state grass. Uh, some of the larger plants, we have the golden yarrow. And if you look closely here, you can see it is just covered with these little owlet moths. Uh, we have the pearly everlasting um, and the uh, silver bush lupins. And then uh, on the Perennial grasses, we have uh, foothill needle grass, that substantial stands of that in slightly moister areas. So we've been able to document some really remarkable uh, native biodiversity out in the grasslands that we're gonna be working to uh, enhance. And we got into the moister areas of the park, the, the semi-wetlands and uh, meadows, in the main swell came across a large stand of the western dwarf flax. Uh, that's one of the listed species. And then we have uh, some locally rare species like the long rayed brodea. And we know that's a wetland there because we have this uh, rush growing right next to it. So it was really fascinating to get into the moister parts of the preserve. 
So speaking of moisture, we're trying to relate the species distributions to environmental factors. So with a little uh, GIS magic and some uh, multivariate statistical voodoo, we can relate the uh, distribution and abundance of species to environmental factors like this topographic moisture index which is basically areas that are shedding water on upper slopes, which are in uh, kind of the pink and the whites. And the blue areas are where water concentrates and accumulates. Um, it's also a good surrogate for soil depth. Um, we also have a map of the solar radiation. This is the north versus south slopes uh, that we're all pretty familiar with. So. We have grasslands. I've, I'm just highlighting the grassland areas here. Uh, we have grasslands that are very, very warm facing south slopes. And then we have pockets of uh, north slopes that are much cooler and moister. We also have our uh, um, underlying geology. Uh, ranging from serpentine, gray, wacky, chert, and greenstone. And then the surficial soils are actually a little more complex because often we'll get uh, a greenstone soils on top of serpentine. So a very interesting um, geomorphology going on out there. And I really need to uh, credit Paul Heipel for getting us on track on how to interpret the geomorphology. So uh, the other highlights, as Barry mentioned, we really took a close look at the milkweeds for uh, as a host plant of the monarch butterfly. So there's Paul next to a robust stand of milkweeds. There's Perry, looks like he's getting ready to take off like the milkweed seeds are there. And the milkweeds are not there just for the monarch butterflies. They're just incredible biodiversity magnets. So the summer generation of the Ackman blues and those spectacular but dangerous tarantula hawks are found uh, nectaring on the milkweeds. Um, but unfortunately, uh, our search for larvae uh, did not uh, lead to any uh, larvae being found, although in previous years, uh, monarch larvae have been pretty easy to find. So we're going to continue with that. So uh, it turns out that we had um, over 10,000 stems of milkweeds in these patches, uh, which is the most abundant milkweed populations in on the peninsula, according to Paul. And one of the reasons why there's so much milkweed there is because the weed warriors have reduced the competition from the yellow star thistle. They are competing for resources at the same time for water and nutrients. And the milkweed has had a chance, has some room to expand. So there were several adult monarchs observed in the spring, uh, March through June. Uh, Paul and Perry searched 10,000, uh, I'm sorry, 1,000 plus stems, but we got no larvae in August. And like I said, we're going to be coming back next year and trying to do the larval search through the entire season. We're also figuring out how to maybe enhance the milkweed populations by mowing the Italian ryegrass that really dominates a lot of the swales. Uh, this sets the milkweed phenology back so that we end up with flowering milkweed later in the season that may be more uh, attractive to monarchs and uh, also creates multi-stemmed milkweed plants and gives them a chance to expand. And uh, there we have uh, Alf and Perry contemplating the future of milkweeds at Edgewood. 
as we were out there, we were also looking for other opportunities to reduce non-native cover and increase native cover. So we have this boundary down here, uh, the really wet areas on the uh, south side of the park where incredibly dense Italian ryegrass and flat areas, that's the non-native, really dense thatch. But we have the native perennial ryegrass that uh, looks like it's starting to expand into the, what was dominated by the non-native ryegrass. So we think that mowing a strip a few meters wide uh, will allow the native ryegrass to start occupying the space and keep the non-native ryegrass out. And that's going to be one of the experiments coming up this year. But simply being out there and noticing all of these uh, opportunities was uh, just a fantastic experience getting to know the park at this level. We're also documenting local rarities. Um, there's a species called a Rigeron reductus angustatus that was pointed um, and it's the own the population in Edgewood is in that little light green polygon on the north side of the South Hill. This is what it looks like uh, you know maybe uh, six inches to a foot tall. Uh, it's also known as the Lesser California Rayless Fleabane. And this was brought to our attention by Kenny Hickman, who uh, in conjunction with John Rawlings and all the botany nerds at Edgewood are were revi revising the plant list and trying to get that nailed down as well as looking at rarities in the Santa Cruz mountains. And it's just tapping into the local knowledge that we have in the Edgewood community is just an utterly uh, amazing experience. So um, I started out talking about the coefficient of beauty. We have um, scientific terminology for it. I call it I sub B. We add in some blue-eyed grass, some clarkias and mariposa lilies, some brogias, some uh, mule's ears, some annual lupins, some wetland white brodias, and uh, learn how to encourage them within the sea of non-native weeds and will make the world a more colorful place because with I sub B, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And we all behold the beauty of Edgewood. So thank you. Thank you, Stu. That was great. That was really, really great. Um, maybe we'll just check with Perry. Were there any questions that came up for Stu before we move on? Uh, no, there are no questions. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll be around at the end and hang out if anybody wants to question. So I'm going to stop sharing now. There we go. <sighs> the, the handoff worked. Great. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So um, now we're going to get to one of our favorite parts of the general meeting, which is the Best Friend Award. And um, the best friend of Edgewood County Park and Natural Preserve for 2020 is Howie Smith. So Howie has been an Edgewood supporter for over a decade. In that time, he has contributed so much to our organization. Um, he has guided us with his extensive botanical knowledge, land stewardship vision and foresight. He's made significant contributions to Edgewood's Green Grass Initiative and the fight against sudden oak death in the preserve. As I mentioned before, he's the driving force behind Edgewood's native garden. He works there every week. He tirelessly cultivates hundreds of plants from carefully collected native seeds, rescues specimens from trail cleaning, 
clearing, weeding, watering, spreading yards and yards of wood chip mulch. <laughs> He has generously volunteered his time and expertise as a past weed warrior, helped establish Edward, Edgewood Farms with Perry. He is a graduate of the docent class of 20, or 2009 and has since become an instructor, teaching future docents about what makes Edgewood so special. He is also a former two-term board member. So Howie's warmth, kindness, Encouraging attitude and wry good humor make him a very special best friend for 2020. So I know we are muted, but um, we could all give him a round of virtual <laughs> applause for Howie. And um, I don't know, Phil, if we can find him, maybe you'd like to say a few words. Can, can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, great. Oh, okay. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, I I would certainly like to thank the the board of directors and the, and the friends of Edgewood for this this recognition. Um, the board hope oh, we might have lost your your audio, Howie. Certainly my volunteering there has been a, uh, a labor of love. I mean, I just enjoy uh, working there and uh, interacting with all the many other uh, friends that, that, uh, that visit the park. Um, I would like to, uh, to thank um, uh, Ken Himes and, and Kenny Hickman and, and Paul Heipel and Al Alf Fingler for sharing their knowledge and support uh, for the work that I have uh, have done in the in the, the native garden and in, in just my general education. So again, thank you all uh, very much for this 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 wonderful recognition. Well, thank you again, Howie. Um, you always so show so much appreciation for our, what others do. It's very nice to give, have a chance to show our appreciation for you this time. So um, this year we were not able to hold our regular volunteer appreciation event, which we usually have earlier in the year. And um, so we wanted to take just one more minute to recognize another volunteer who's gone above and beyond the call of duty in 2020 with our Habitat Hero Award. And um, our Habitat Hero for 2020 is Caroline Bowker. Caroline took docent training in the class of 2019, and she was disappointed not to be able to lead hikes this first year after her graduation, but has dedicated herself to being a steward of the preserve nonetheless. She was one of the volunteers who stepped up to participate in the Yellow Star Thistle campaign the summer of 2019. And she walked with Mary and Dennis Wilson almost every Friday, learning the flowers from them from early 2019 until their retirement from the Bloomin' Hikes this spring. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, she's part of the new weekly wildflower survey team. And Caroline also walks in Edgewood on her own many times a week. You will often, I'm there and I see her all the time on the trails. <laughs> um, Entirely on her own initiative, Caroline began collecting trash while she walks with ever greater intensity as the number of park users has increased over the course of the pandemic and the tossed bottles and food wrappers and drop masks that have marred the beauty of our trails and in the case of the masks that are um, a danger to wildlife. She even picked up a trash picker for herself so she can reach farther into the poison oak and with her quick presence of mind, she is responsible for adding another mammal to the park species list, the long tail weasel. Um, Caroline was, was hiking along the Baywood Glen Trail and spotted the weasel, got her camera out and the presence of mind, <laughs> snap pictures for us. And um, so we have a, a new mammal to, to Caroline to thank for that. Um, I don't know if Caroline is on here, on today. I don't know. Bill, did you happen to see her? I didn't see her. Okay. Well, if you see her out on the trails, please 
thank her for everything that she's done and um, know that she is a true Habitat hero. So um, now, in our last few minutes together, we just have to take care of a little business. Um, I would like to now call our, officially call our member general meeting to order and um, have us vote on the 2020 Board of Directors slate. Um, as we planned our first ever virtual meeting, we, we realized that the, our common practice of being able to put a slate in front of you and have people um, provide opportunities from the picnic tables to make nominations wasn't really gonna work. So we, um, I think you'll re you may remember, we solicited nominations earlier in the year and um, there were, no takers, we didn't have any other ones, so we feel confident that our candidate slate is ready for consideration. So, um, Madam Secretary, Linda, if you're out there, can you affirm that we have a quorum of membership present? Yes, we do have a quorum. Great. Now, in a moment, I'm going to ask um, anyone who is a current member of Friends of Edgewood to cast your vote via a poll that we will pop up in just a second. Um, first, I want to announce the continuing directors. Those are Lori Alexander, Sandy Bernhard, Laura Fox, Kathy Goforth, Peter Ingram, Bill Korboltz, Kathy Korboltz, Perry McCarty, and Barry Moore. And now I'd like to present the slate of candidates for 2021. Linda Leon, who's an incumbent, and Alan Angela Mallett, who's an incumbent. Um, so I'd like to see if we have a motion to accept the slate of candidates recommended for by the nominating committee. This is Sandy Bernhard. I move to accept the slate of candidates for the Friends of Edgewood directors for the term 2021 to 2023 as recommended by the nominating committee and consisting of Linda Leong incumbent and Angela Mallet incumbent. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, do we have a second? This is Lori Alexander. I'll second that motion. Great. So um, we should get a poll. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Maybe I have to do that to, so you can see the poll. Um, so you should see the poll there and everyone can take a minute to place your votes. Okay, I think we will close. I'll give everyone one more second to submit your vote and we can close the poll. Great, so Madam Secretary, can you affirm the election poll results? Yes, the motion passes. Great, um, thank you at all. We appreciate getting that little bit of business out of the way. Um, I just want to pause for a second and see if we have any final questions, Perry, any, anything else that has come up while we've been chatting today? Uh, no, no, there are no further questions. Well, um, then we have reached the end of our meeting. I just want to express the full board's gratitude to each and every member and our volunteers, our partners, all of you for your incredible support and especially for your help as we continue to rise to the challenge of 2020 and beyond. We are so ready for this year to be done. Um, if any of the activities that we shared today are of interest to you, please just reach out and um, let us know because we would love to get you involved in whatever way you desire. There is so much to be done at Edgewood to honor the incredible efforts that preceded this startling new chapter. I'd like to give some special thanks to Bill Korboltz for organizing all our Zoom logistics and orchestrating this meeting. You can't even imagine how many hours he put into making sure that this would be a success. And to Perry for bravely managing the chat and the tech support and Kathy for being our poll manager and everyone else who helped um, us practice and get ready for today. So, um, with that, I will ask Bill to unmute us all so that we can have a few minutes together to um, last, have some last comments and say goodbye. And again, thank you all for coming. We um, survived and we are now adjourned.
and, and we're now and now that we're adjourned, there is one question. Uh, has there been any changes to rainfall levels over the years? It changes, yeah, I just wanna, it, it just changes every year. So, um, you know, it's, we're in an age of, of climate or weather whiplash, where we're seeing more highly variable uh, precipitation and temperatures from, you know, almost on every time scale from month to month, from year to year. So, um, you know, thinking about the last decade, we had two of the wettest years ever in 2017 and 2019. Then we also had the most severe four year drought period in the last thousand years. So, and we all know how like in the middle of winter, like this last winter, we can have 45 days with no rainfall in the heart of the rainy season. So it's, it's more a matter of the variability is increasing and it's, uh, really is a manifestation of global climate change. It's not really a trend. Um, it's just more highly variable.